Today's episode is sponsored by Otherworld. They're one of our favorite new sustainable food brands. Otherworld has reimagined our favorite childhood breakfast. They've created plant-based, superfood-packed pancake and waffle mixes that are super tasty and easy to make. Our favorite flavor is apple cinnamon. It's packed with apple and sweet potato and naturally sweetened with dates, so there's no added sugar. Also, their metal packaging is made using recycled content and can be recycled right in the curbside bin. Pretty otherworldly. Hey, Definers. This is Keaton, the audio engineer here at Sustainability Defined. Believe it or not, this isn't my full-time job. I'm also the founder of Audio Snack, a Detroit-based custom music house specializing in professional, made-to-order music at affordable prices. Audio Snack can't save the planet, but we can save your next project with amazing custom music. Learn more at audio-snack.com. Hey, Definers, before we start this episode, just a quick apology. The audio quality on my end just isn't as crisp this time. Technical issues, but rest assured, Scott sounds as beautifully amazing as, as ever. So anyways, apologies in advance, but we'll get that taken care of next time. All right, Definers, welcome back to Sustainability Defined, where Jay and I are still here, defining sustainability one concept and one bad joke at a time. Today is episode 63, and it's on sea level rise, a very important topic, and we'll get to that in a minute. So Jay, tell us about the outline for the episode. So first, we're going to ask, what is sea level rise? Followed by, how is climate change causing sea level rise to happen? Then we'll ask, how much has the sea risen historically? And then how fast and how much is the sea expected to rise in the coming years? Then we'll ask what are the impacts of the expected sea level rise and how does it perhaps differ across geographies and industries? We'll move into what we can do to adapt to the coming sea level rise. And then finally introduce our guest, John Englander. And Jay, before we get into this, we want to say a couple things to the listeners, which is that you know here on our podcast, Jay, we've discussed new climate resilient solutions. We've shared up and coming sustainable industries. We've provided helpful, empowering tips for definers to implement in their own lives. But today, you and I, we're going to be diving into one of the effects of climate change that threatens to most upend our lives. And that's sea level rise, which we'll refer to this episode as SLR. Now, the scale of the effects are trillions of dollars and hundreds of millions of people. So, we're still going to work in some jokes. I'm sure we're going to do that. But this is a pretty weighty topic. And it's honestly, as we were researching this and writing this, it's hard to not get a bit overwhelmed thinking about the ramifications and also not to get into the trap of cognitive dissonance, where people have a thought and then there's a behavior that conflicts with it, and then they rationalize that behavior to avoid the dissonance. Now, there may be some people that have lived on the coast for decades, and then they hear about the science around sea level rise, and then they find a way to dismiss it uh, so that they can keep living as they always have. And that makes sense psychologically, but as we hear today, the science is undeniable, sea level rise is coming, and we must act, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, with the fierce urgency of now. So with that intro, Jay, let's get into it. All right, so let's start by asking, what is sea level rise? And sure, the name sea level rise might speak for itself, but let's break it apart and, quote, see how we can, quote, level up our understanding and, quote, rise together to make a difference. Props to Amelia for that wonderful (laughs) phrase. (laughs) So sea level rise is an increase in the level of the world's oceans due to the effects of climate change. There are two main drivers increasing ocean volume. Those are ice melt and thermal expansion. Okay, very important point there, Jay. So we now know that the two main contributors to SLR are ice melting and thermal expansion, but how does that work? Well, first off, let's talk about what's not causing SLR. Contrary to popular belief and to what is sometimes advertised, the melting of icebergs is not contributing to SLR. So it's not like any ice melting contributes to sea level rise. John Englander, who is our expert in today's podcast, he highlights in his new book, Moving to Higher Ground, Rising Sea Level and the Path Forward, a simple science experiment to explain why icebergs aren't the culprit when it comes to SLR. Now, we're going to be referencing this book throughout the episode while diving into different important aspects of SLR. So John says to consider ice cubes in a glass of water. The ice cubes are like miniature icebergs. When the ice melts, you'll notice that the level of water in the glass does not rise. 
same thing in the ocean. If the icebergs melt, it doesn't change the level of the oceans. Now, rather than icebergs, the ice that contributes to SLR is the ice on land in the form of ice sheets and glaciers. Ice sheets and glaciers represent 200 feet of potential SLR and hold 98% of the global ice on land. Antarctica and Greenland are the world's two biggest ice sheets, holding about 98% of the global ice on land. And Antarctica is the biggest one here. It alone holds more than 80% of potential SLR. Okay, so here's melting ice, but of course, let's not forget about thermal expansion. It's the second largest contributor to global sea level rise, and it occurs as water expands very slightly in volume as it gets warmer. Over the last century, as the oceans have warmed up about two degrees Fahrenheit or one degree Celsius, they have increased in height by four inches or 10 centimeters just from thermal expansion. This is about the same contribution as from ice on land. But now, of course, ice on land is starting to dominate with the increasing melt rate of glaciers and ice sheets. This one kind of blew my mind, Jay, right? Like, it's such a basic fact of chemistry that water expands as it gets warmer. But to think about it on the ocean scale is kind of mind-boggling. Well, because you're, you're truly going, like, atomic scale to macro scale, and you see how writ large those like tiny, tiny changes have a ridiculously sized impact. Totally, totally. Okay, so let's go to the next part of our outline, which is how is climate change causing SLR to happen? So we know ice on land melting and thermal expansion are the two main contributors to SLR, but why are they melting? What's the climate science behind this? And before we get into the effects of humid-caused climate change, let's talk about natural variations in temperature. Now, there's more than one, but a very important natural variation is the Milankovitch cycle. This cycle is due to the elliptical or not perfect circle orbit of the Earth around the Sun, the angular or not upright spinning of the Earth's axis, and that the Earth wobbles as it spins on its axis. So it's got several causes. And this cycle accounts for heating and cooling periods that occur over thousands of years. Now, there are some deniers of climate change that say these natural cycles of the planet, that's why SLR or any symptom of climate change is even occurring. But it's important to remember that this cycle and other natural variations can't explain the rapid warming that has occurred since the Industrial Revolution in the mid-19th century. In fact, according to the natural cycles, we should have started the period of sea level falling, but instead, it's now rising again. So it's kind of mind-boggling to think about how we've been in this wonderful period during the 8,000 years or so of human civilization where Earth hasn't changed much, but it does naturally go through wild swings. Today, however, our current upward swing is not natural, with CO2 levels higher than they've been in the last 3 million years. And although they still account for only 0.04% of the atmosphere, that still adds up to billions upon billions of tons of heat-trapping gas. It's kind of like how alcohol can affect your own motor skills while only a very small percentage of it is actually in your bloodstream. Feedback loops also play a role in accelerating warming. One feedback loop example is called the ice albedo feedback. Basically, as the Arctic continues to warm, sea ice is lost due to the warming. The ice melting exposes more dark ocean, which has a lower albedo than the white ice, since the white ice reflects light while the dark ocean absorbs solar energy. More heat absorbed means more ice melting And then, even more exposed dark ocean, hence this feedback loop. Jay, I think these feedback loops are kind of what scares me, where it's like, man, once this gets going, how do we stop it? You almost can't. And that's why, as you read about climate change, there's a lot of talk about tipping points. You know, is there a point of no return where these feedback loops just have a mind of their own? Yeah, you can feel as if a lot of this stuff is already out of our control. Right. But then once it reaches these tipping points, it's like, well... All right, I I guess we're along for the ride. Right. And we're going to get to what to do, so hold on, stick with us here. (laughs) But uh, let's talk about how much the sea has risen historically, because I think this is very interesting. So an important aspect of understanding the big changes in global sea level is looking at the rock-solid science, the history of Earth's ice ages. For thousands of years, carbon dioxide, global average temperature, and sea level have moved in close synchronization, triggering warming and cooling periods. When Earth was farther from the sun, we received less heat energy. 
which is quite similar to the way we receive less heat during the winter season each year. You could actually think of the 100,000-year warming and cooling ice age cycles like a large-scale version of summer and winter. Think about how tan you could get, Scott, from a <laughs> yeah. summer that lasts that long. <laughs> and, you, know, you need to, and how much hot chocolate you drink in those winters. <laughs> you need to stock up at Costco on some sunscreen and such, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> All right, so two and a half million years ago, mile-high ice sheets and glaciers existed far from the poles, even into the mid-latitude region. As these ice sheets come and go, sea level can rise and fall as much as 400 feet. The most recent significant sea level rise began about 18,000 years ago, following the natural warming pattern coming out of the last ice age. As the ice sheets melted, sea level rose at an average of about 4 feet per century over the course of 10,000 years. Now, 4 feet in a century is only one half inch, or slightly more than a centimeter, per year. An amount that couldn't be perceived... But of course, it adds up, and just four feet would be challenging as perhaps an understatement for many of today's coastal areas. Right, and in this century, Jay, the rate of sea level rise will almost certainly be much faster than we've seen in history because the current increasing rate of warming is much faster than has been seen by natural warming cycles. And before we talk about what's expected here in just a little bit, let's touch on the rise of sea level in recent history. So over the 20th century, average rise was less than two millimeters or seven hundredths of an inch per year. That's not a lot, but the acceleration and trend should get our attention. Starting in 1993, over the next two decades, the rate of rise was 3.1 millimeters per year. Then from 2010 to 2019, the rate of rise was 4.5 millimeters a year or two tenths of an inch. This quick doubling in rate is what should concern us as it can mean very fast growth. And I think, Scott, what's kind of most challenging about that is that it, even though this rate is doubling, it's still, you can't perceive it. You right. Know, we know it's there, but you can't see it. It's hard to get people up in arms. And I, I liken this doubling to, you think about COVID, you know, the doubling is what had people concerned, right? Where if the infections were kept doubling, we'd be overwhelmed at hospitals but at the lower levels, it was kind of hard to get people really seeing the magnitude of it. But it was like, man, if this trend continues, we're in trouble. And I think it's the same thing here. Bingo. So let's use that then as a transition and ask how fast and how much is the sea expected to rise here in the coming years? Well, before we dive into it, Jay, let's get one thing straight. And this is a really important point uh, and kind of scary too, that even if we stopped emitting carbon tomorrow, just done, the world's sea level will still rise with devastating effects. And this is because of the stunning amounts of heat going into our ocean. The amount of heat accumulating in the ocean, this is crazy, Jay, is equivalent to about five atomic bombs worth of heat every second, every day. My goodness. That's what's happening. That is, every second, that's happening. That is just, I, I can't even wrap my head around that. And the excess heat already stored in the sea will continue to melt the ice sheets for centuries, raising global sea levels. So you've got this... Energy in the oceans are so vast, you know, there's this lag time, but it, it's going to occur over time. So how much is sea level going to rise? Well, science can't predict the rise, and the rise could happen quickly. The incremental pace of the rise, it can lull us into complacency. We've been talking about that, Jay. But John Englander says we should expect like one to two feet in the next 30 years and 10 feet of sea level rise by the end of the century. And his informed guess is that 10,000 communities would be impacted with a sea level rise of five feet, many of these communities with huge population centers. And let's add some context here, Scott. So while that's what John expects, the most recognized projection for sea level rise is from the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, the IPCC. The IPCC, of course, is the body of the world's leading climate experts charged with preparing comprehensive reports on the state of our climate knowledge. Now, in the IPCC's worst case scenario, it says there will only be three feet of sea level rise by 2100, which is a fair bit lower than what John is suggesting. Well, the question is why? And even in its worst case scenario, the IPCC includes just six inches of sea level rise from Antarctica. Now, folks, recall that Antarctica holds more than 80% of 
of potential sea level rise. The IPCC includes such a small amount because the rise from Antarctica can't be predicted with the level of certainty required by its own rules. Now, John states in his book that six inches of sea level rise from Antarctica is not at all representative of what the glaciologists believe to be at stake, as that six inches is out of a potential 186 feet of sea level contribution from the southern continent. He calls this the Antarctic asterisk, and I think this asterisk is indeed the size of Antarctica. This is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a big asterisk, and it's, it's um, I think John might call it misleading, but the point is that a lot of people really rely on the IPCC. So mm -hmm. the fact that they're underestimating this, a lot of people might just see that top line number, not see the asterisk, and then not have the bold, urgent action that is needed. Mm -hmm. So Jay, if John is right uh, with his estimate, you know, 10 feet by 2100, there would be significant impacts on our environment and our way of life. So let's get into that. What are the impacts of the expected sea level rise? And how does it differ across geographies and industries? Well, first, let's note that SLR does not affect every place on Earth equally. Some areas are particularly vulnerable. For example, in the United States, sea levels at hot spots along the East Coast, Gulf of Mexico, and northwestern Hawaiian Islands are rising three to four times faster than the global average. All right, so what should we expect? Let's first talk environmental impacts. The IPCC, which we just talked about, identifies that the expected impacts of SLR on coastal ecosystems over the course of the century include habitat contraction, forced inland migration of animals, and loss of biofunctionality and biodiversity. So on biodiversity, there was a groundbreaking report from the Center of Biological Diversity that found the 233 threatened and endangered species in 23 coastal U.S. states are at risk of harm from sea level rise due to effects such as habitat loss, and saltwater intrusion on water sources. This means that left unchecked, rising sea levels threaten the survival of 17%, or one out of six, of the United States' federally protected species. Okay, so that's what we should expect from an environmental impact perspective. Let's talk about socioeconomic impacts now. First major topic in this category being migration and climate refugees. Though climate change is caused by the world's wealthiest nations, its consequences are felt disproportionately in developing countries that have almost no responsibility for releasing greenhouse gas emissions. So let's consider Bangladesh here. It's one of the most densely populated countries in the world, with 160 million people in an area the size of Wisconsin. <laughs> Very high poverty levels exist there, as it is ranked the 11th poorest country in the world. Unfortunately, it faces extreme consequences of sea level rise. Over 6% of the country is already underwater, which will rise to approximately 20% with just one meter or three feet of additional sea level rise. Recall that John is projecting 10 feet of sea level rise by 2100, which is ex just extremely concerning. Yeah, I mean, and I would say John's estimate, you know, is around 10 feet, right? But even if it's a little bit less than that. Right. Like it's right. still like a crazy, that's just a crisis just waiting yes. to happen. That's going to happen. Yes. All right. <laughs> let's, uh, uh, let's keep on moving here. Moving uh, right along. <laughs> okay. So coastal flooding. So the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, estimates that by the year 2100, three feet of sea level rise will affect an additional 4.2 million people in the U.S., with Florida accounting for nearly half of that total at-risk population. And then at six feet, the number jumps to 13.1 million people in the U.S. being impacted. So a quick note on Florida. It's a great example of what we were talking about earlier, that different areas will have different impacts. Consider that Orlando is 80 feet above sea level, and the capital of Florida, Tallahassee, is 200 feet above sea level. So those areas of the state are relatively safe from the worst effects. All right, so thank God Disney World is, is well positioned here. Yes, let's get our priorities, sure. <laughs> I'm sure that's what Walt was thinking about. <laughs> Incredible foresight, that man. Uh -huh. And then if we look globally, Jay, a recent study found that if sea levels are just one to two more feet, the amount of coastal land at risk of flooding would increase by roughly one-third. In 2050, the study said that up to 204 million people currently living along the coast would face flooding risks. 
And by 2100, that rises to as much as 253 million people under a moderate emission scenario known as RCP 4.5. So like we said earlier, John is thinking around 10 feet by 2100. So these millions of people impacted is pretty real because all these studies I just mentioned were looking at two feet, six feet. So yeah, this is, this is serious. And we can't do it on the podcast, but seeing visuals can also help make it real. And if you go to our website, sustainabilitydefined.com, you go to these intro notes, we link to an article from October 2021 that features visuals from the nonprofit Climate Central. And it shows to what extent well-known places will be underwater in different scenarios. It's pretty jarring. Yeah, and Scott, to this point, when you shared this, I it, it blew me away. And so mm-hmm. they have different renderings of different places that they show. Right. And one of them is the National Mall in DC. Yeah. And you live in DC. I you know, I lived there for a bit and like you don't consider us necessarily like oceanfront at all. But of course, right. you know, we're on the Potomac River and and that's of course subject to, to sea level rise. But it's crazy just to see the renderings of what the National Mall would look like as just like a giant lake effectively. I mean that's the kind of stuff that these renders, I think, do a good job of, of conveying, you know, and again, back to your point, Scott, whether it's two feet, three feet, four feet, I mean, the impacts are still going to be pretty drastic. So I would definitely encourage all of our definers to go check out these images. And in terms of visuals, Jay, there's actually a really good movie called Chasing Ice. Have you heard of it? Mm -mm. So it's a documentary about the melting ice and it has stunning visuals where you see you know, the, the rivers of water underneath the glaciers that are melting them and the, the ice chunks falling off. And that movie is really impactful as well from a visual perspective. All right. So we've been talking about socioeconomic impacts of sea level rise. The third bullet under this topic we're going to talk about is GDP and really just general economic impacts. So John says the adaptation to sea level rise will be the greatest economic driver this century. From an economic sense, it will likely devastate many while being a boon to others. And as John notes in his book, crisis in Chinese, in the Chinese language, has two characters, both danger and opportunity. I love that. Yeah. So when it comes to the value of assets lost from projected coastal flooding, 17 to $210 trillion in assets are projected to be lost by 2100 with the severity of assets lost depending on adaptation strategies utilized. It's, it is an enormous number. And big range, right, Jay? But even if it's not at the top end of that range, yes, exactly. it's still crazy. Exactly. Another recent study found that people currently living in areas at risk from a three-foot rise in sea levels owned $14 trillion in assets in 2011, an amount equal to 20% of global GDP that year. So that tells you, Jay, how much these coastal assets are worth, right? Huge. Valuable stuff. Now, this loss of value wouldn't just be those whose homes go underwater. And those homes, they might actually start losing value even before the water comes, as people anticipate it coming. And note that even those on higher ground may also lose property value. John tells a story in his most recent book of a reader who sent him a note saying, your first book caused me to think about how even though my house is well above sea level, That is not the case for many in my community. And if my community starts to fail, my house may not flood, but it will still lose value. So that kind of shook me, you know, that we're talking big numbers here and homes flooding, but even the homes that don't flood can be impacted. Right. And and again, Scott, I think we we touched on this just now, but you you can look at this from both like an immediate physical perspective where Mm -hmm. my house is threatened by sea level rise. But you also have just these this massive investment in this real estate to begin with. And so, you know, if if one event or, or perhaps, you know, one city starts to get truly impacted by sea level rise, well, there are all these different groups that have invested in these real assets that will trigger these negative economic consequences way elsewhere, even if, you know, those funds themselves aren't located in the city. So, I mean, it's it's so interconnected. Totally. Uh, and, and it just impacts society on just so many different levels. And we mentioned it at the, at the top, but it, like what you're describing, that we're talking trillions of dollars in, in swing of value. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, wow, this is a yeah. fundamental shift in how we operate. 
Right. And of course, you know, none of these funds are planning to write off, you know, trillions of dollars in assets. So exactly. like, that's just going to be a massive chasm to have to cross. Right. And some people, they typically think like 30 years out, like a right. the length of life of mortgage. But man, we got to think further than that. So, but Jay, when we talk about trillion dollar swings, there's a swing the other way. So what about the economic opportunity with SLR? And with so much uncertainty along the coastline, people and capital, they're probably going to seek refuge elsewhere. Cities that are isolated from sea level rise, but accessible to the ocean shipping lanes, may see a very positive effect on their property values and economic growth. Cities near the Great Lakes, or on the Mississippi, Amazon, or Thames rivers, will not be affected by that three feet in SLR that we've been talking about, unlike many major coastal ports. And they may provide stable ports for global and regional shipping centers. Right. And fun fact here. Well, actually, I don't know if it's a fun fact <laughs> yeah. talking about this topic, but it's a fact regardless. Uh, the Great Lakes here in the U.S. will not be impacted by sea level rise anytime soon as they're actually hundreds of feet above sea level. I did not know that. And I didn't know that either, Jay. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's crazy to think about that it's that high, that much water. Mm -hmm. And aside from the economic benefits of the shipping routes, Scott, which you just mentioned, it's foreseeable that communities on stable rivers and lakes may benefit from the growing uncertainty about oceanfront locations. Uh, after all, and, and you know, I know this to be true being in real estate, water views are prized in either setting. So as a result, there is good upmarket potential for many lakeside or riverside properties. Jay, why don't you start a real estate firm that specializes in this sort of thing? Scott, the wheels are spinning. The wheels are <laughs> yeah. certainly spinning. Okay. <laughs> It's going to be the ad on our next episode. <laughs> right. And another socioeconomic impact here, Jay, is small island extinction. Islands across the world would be severely impacted by the impacts to SLR due to their high exposure to coastal areas and intensified cyclone activity, even with best-case scenario projections. Now, a rise of just three feet, that could submerge as much as two-thirds of Kiribati by the end of the century, and I know other islands are similarly situated. Okay, so we, we've been talking a lot about what are the impacts of expected sea level rise. We've broken that down so far in, into two buckets. We have environmental impacts and then socioeconomic impacts. Number three we're going to focus on is perhaps unique industry impacts that sea level rise poses. So the first one we're going to touch on is insurance rates. So changes to the main U.S. flood insurance program will raise rates for 77% of policyholders. In fact, by April of 2022, most current policyholders will see their premiums go up and continue to rise by 18% per year for the next 20 years. That's exorbitant. But Jay, I mean, it's, just, it's also just bringing it in line with reality. I mean, we haven't been charging enough. The risk is, right. is high. Right. I mean, it's, it's truly a, a market correction. Here. Right. Should taxpayers be subsidizing all these people that have chosen yes. to live in dangerous areas? I don't think so. And should we give them that price signal, you probably shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. So some policyholders will only see modest increases, of course, but some high-risk homes can potentially see increases upwards of $12,000 a year in insurance costs. Again, Scott, to your point. Mm -hmm. So along with that, home prices and, and devaluation is, of course, another area to focus on under unique industry impacts. We've talked about it a bit, but even now, Homes exposed to sea level rise sell for about 7% less than their unexposed counterparts, as just one inch of water can cause $25,000 of damage to a home. So that's one inch, Scott. How about uh, 10 feet? Yeah. Have you had problems with flooding, Jay, anywhere you've lived? I guess I've had my basement flood in my childhood home, but beyond that, and that, that was know, pretty damaging. So Not... You know, Denver is, is definitely a little bit insulated, but, you know, um, my mom uh, had moved back to Houston and she was there for Harvey. Mm. And, yeah, that's a, a different kind of flooding, as I think John will, will touch on in our interview. But, um, no, I mean, and, and she's it's, it's funny. She's a, a realtor in Houston and she saw firsthand the economic impacts of flood damage and what that does to home prices. It's, it's pretty remarkable. Yeah, and it's so violating. I mean, you know, this is your home. This is your personal right. stuff. And, so. and again, it's, it's funny, Scott, because it's like, well, okay, if, if my home floods with, you know, one inch of water, like, okay, it's one inch, you know, like my ceiling height is like nine feet. Yeah. But you just think about all of the, you know, systems that are uh, 
you know, under your feet, or mm-hmm. even if just furniture is exposed to water that starts to mold. I mean, electrical it, stuff. Who knows? Electrical stuff. Yeah. I mean, it, she, she would send me pictures driving down the streets in Houston where people had just thrown heaps of just furniture and, mm. you know, couches, bookshelves, stuff that had, had gotten wet is, you know, at risk of molding. And it's, it just, it was like just trash everywhere. It was, it was pretty, uh, pretty jarring. Wow. Okay. Well, just one more point here on the unique industry impact. So SLR offers an opportunity for many professionals to be part of the solution as well as gain business. These include lawyers, engineers, architects, city planners, and finance professionals. John in particular says architects must lead since they can create a built environment that is aesthetically pleasing while functional in our new reality. Okay. And so Scott, I think that that leads us well to our next point, which is what can we do to adapt to the coming sea level rise? So planning ahead for sea level rise will enhance or undermine future economies depending on how communities approach the issue. Those that think strategically and engage in robust long-term planning will almost certainly be rewarded at the expense of those that think short-term and narrowly. At the macro level, John says we need to do two things. Slow the warming and intelligently adapt to rising sea levels. In his book, he distinguishes four separate categories of climate and environmental effort that we can take to reduce the impact of SLR. One is reduce CO2 emissions to slow the warming, the melting ice, and rising sea. This has to be done at a large scale, right, because it's a global problem, and we must do this to reduce the severity of sea level rise and other climate change impacts. But of course, we have to recognize what we said earlier, that the existing excess heat in the ocean is going to result in significant sea level rise and adapt accordingly. Mm-hmm. So it's not like cut, cut off the CO2 emissions and this problem goes right. away. Very important to note. And the second thing is prepare for the more frequent flood events that are already occurring by being more resilient. So one way to prepare is building infrastructure that can still function in the new reality of SLR. Right. And, and Scott, shout out here to the architects we just highlighted. So in the Netherlands, public parks like Rotterdam's Bentham Plain have been developed as attractive, useful, quote, water squares or places that can function during good weather as community gathering places with recreational facilities. But thanks to their clever design, they actually become short-term water storage during deluge rain or flooding, which diverts the extra water from flooding the streets and homes, which is, I think, super cool. Yeah, and John's got a bunch of examples like this in his yeah. book. So, um, But we also want to mention that don't think that preparing for more frequent flood events means we just need more water pumps. Because for one, pumps can be very energy intensive. And in some places, pumps are useless because of the geography. Consider our cities like Miami are built on porous limestone, which means the water will literally rise up through the ground, making the pumps pretty useless. And Jay, this is another one where I'm just like, oh my God, I hadn't thought about like, the, geo- the kind of geology that's under cities yeah. and how that can yeah. change dynamics here. Mm-hmm. So at a certain point as well, Jay, it may make sense to move to higher ground. John in his book talks about how the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is now looking at if protecting New Orleans from a 100-year storm is technically possible as well as economically justified. You know, at a certain point, you got to think, is this worth it? Right. right. And this review is after the Army Corps spent $14 billion fortifying the levees. So it concluded that the system it had just put in is not going to provide the required risk reduction as early as 2023. So that's just how quickly the guideposts are moving here, where you know we spent all this money, we put something in that we thought would help the city, and it does to an extent. But given how quickly things are changing, we're going to need more, and do we want to keep investing like that? Exactly. It's, it's the question of, is this money better put to other types of uses, perhaps in a way that we haven't necessarily thought about. Before. Like moving people. I mean, it's like moving people. It's tough yeah. and you don't want to do that, but. Right. So, okay. We're, we're talking about things we can do to adapt to coming sea level rise. We've talked about number one, reducing CO2 emissions to slow the warming. Number two, preparing for more frequent flood events. Number three, prepare for long-term sea level rise by changing building and zoning codes and recognizing the durability of buildings and infrastructure. So we must plan for the rapid and potentially abrupt acceleration of sea level rise in the coming decades. So, of course, places may not want to admit they have a problem, 
but they should start now and, and truly reap the rewards later. Yeah, Jay, I feel like we asked John, you know, for examples of places that have kind of done this, yeah. like we have a problem, we're going to do this bold action, and you, know, you had an example or two, of course, but it's not like, you know, there's a lot of people dragging their feet. Right, and Scott, it's, it's hilarious because we're about to go to an example from 1889 here. Yeah, <laughs> like, nice. You know, we need we need <laughs> more contemporary examples here. So uh, this this example from from history that we ought to draw upon comes from Seattle, and and it's a crazy stat. So back in 1889, Seattle committed to rebuilding its entire city. In some places, raising streets by a whopping 22 feet after a great fire destroyed the area. Seattle had faced flooding for years, and with great foresight, the city took advantage of that disaster as an opportunity to fix the flooding streets. You can actually do tours of the city that used to exist, because some of it's still there, and some, apparently there's even like a coffee shop or two that is existing in the old city. Wow, that's actually fascinating. Yeah. And I haven't done that. That sounds right up my alley. More recently, and here we go, Scott, here's something more, more recent. Mm-hmm. Indonesia announced that it is spending millions of dollars to move its capital to a newly built city, in large part because Jakarta is actively sinking due to subsidence. We also need to build with long-term sea level rise in mind and factor that in when building bridges and such. We can't plan and build based on historical patterns. Right, because the guideposts have changed like we were talking about. Mm-hmm. And sadly, much of our existing infrastructure doesn't account for the new reality. Consider that the United States has 29,000 miles of levees that are helping protect against flooding, and these have an average age of more than 50 years old. And so they were built without present flood risks in mind. Okay, and the fourth point here as far as sea level rise adaptation is addressing the multitude of other critical environmental issues, including clean air, safe drinking water, recycling, ending the scourge of plastics in the ocean, coral reef protection, wildlife and ecosystem conservation and restoration. Just a handful of small topics, Scott. Right. And I think John is saying, you know, we got to do all the, like the building and the way we were talking about, and uh, maybe people need to move certain places. That all needs to happen in parallel with addressing all these other critical issues that you're talking about. Right. It, it's as if, you know, it's, it's a mantra, no matter where you look in sustainability, to know that there is no one silver bullet, right? You, we, nope. have attract, you know, we have to tackle this issue on literally all fronts. All right. So, Jay, I think we can agree. I mean, we had a lot of help from Melee on this episode as well. But if you think we kind of sounded like we knew what we were talking about, that's because we read John's book. Okay, John, (laughs) so much of these intro notes are pulled from his book, admittedly. Uh, And so we're excited to interview him and have you hear directly from him. So John Englander, he's an oceanographer, multi-book author, and international speaker on climate change and SLR. He's logged over 5,000 scuba dives. That's amazing. (laughs) And he was at one point the CEO of the Cousteau Society. Multiple expeditions to Greenland and Antarctica have shown John firsthand the devastating effects of melting ice on land reaching the sea. These expeditions, coupled with his broad science background in both oceanography and geology, give him a unique perspective on planet ecology. So for definers that want to learn more on John Englander, check out his website, johnenglander.net. And again, his most recent book is called Moving to Higher Ground, Rising Sea Level and the Path Forward. But before definers, you branch off into those two sources, let's just jump on over to our interview with John. I guarantee you'll enjoy it. Back to that brand we mentioned before called Other World. All of their mixes are plant-based, which means no milk, butter, or egg normally required for pancakes and waffles. It's just add water. Because they use dates instead of sugar for a natural sweetener, there's also no added sugar. Wow. The best part is that Other World uses upcycled ingredients, which means they're sourcing food that would have otherwise been wasted, like the misfit beet that never makes it to the grocery store shelf, but is perfectly nutritious. When it comes to sustainable, low-carbon food, Other World checks all the boxes, and the taste simply cannot be beat. Even better, our listeners get 20% off their purchase with code DEFINED20 at eatotherworld.com. That's DEFINED, the number two, and then the number zero. Your breakfast or breakfast for dinner is about to be upgraded. Are you tired of wasting countless hours searching for the perfect music for your project and settling on something that's just not quite right? Let Audio Snack's team of songwriters and producers bring your vision to life 
with custom music at affordable rates. Your work deserves better, and that's why with AudioSnack, you have total control over the sound of your project. We will work directly with you to create music that you can be proud of. Check us out at audio-snack.com. AudioSnack, music so good, you'll come back for seconds. All right, Sustainably Defined listeners, we have a treat. We have, I think, the foremost expert on sea level rise, John Englander, uh, joining us for a conversation here. So John, author of Moving to Higher Ground, which we talked quite a bit about in the introduction, oceanographer and president of Rising Seas Institute. John, we go way back. I'm so excited to finally have you on the podcast, so thanks for joining us. Thanks, Scott. Me too. All right, so John, you have a background in geology and oceanography and it luckily happened quite early, but do you remember the first time you heard that term sea level rise? I mean, did it hit you right away of just the gravity of the term or did it, did you come back to it later on in life? Like, tell us that story. Well, the first time I heard about sea level rise and significance was in college. And I hate to say that was 50 years ago. And I was paleogeology, you know, learning about the ice ages. And when I heard that sea level rose 400 feet Mm -hmm. uh, repeatedly, that was a mind blower. But that just was in geologic history, even though it was 20,000 years ago, it wouldn't affect us in the modern era. So it got my attention. But it was somewhere in about 88 or 1990 when climate change was becoming an issue. And Dr. James Hansen gave his rather famous testimony to Congress about the risks of climate change and global Mm -hmm. warming. And he mentioned rising sea level and... um, I think I'm pretty sure that was when, you know, from a, a modern era time frame, that all of a sudden the antenna went up. But even then, um, that's 30 years ago, yeah. none of us could have imagined things warming this quickly. Yeah, or that if it was happening this quickly, that we'd still be a little slow to act, right? And that it's taken this long and we're allowing things to keep taking place. And the longer we delay, the more expensive things get and the harder things get. So exactly. We do want to ask you though about, I don't know if you've written these books, but you've seen things firsthand with your expeditions to Greenland and Antarctica. So how have those shaped your perspectives on sea level rise? You know, you hear this testimony, but there's another level there when you're actually seeing it up close. Can you tell us a bit about one of these trips and how it shaped your thinking? Yeah, thank you. There's probably uh, three different trips I would I would bring. I've, I've probably done a dozen trips to the Arctic or to the polar regions, the North and South Poles. So you've um, got a pretty good jacket, I bet. Then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, in 1985, I did my first trip to the high Arctic. It was a diving expedition. We were diving under the polar ice cap, actually. Wow. Yeah, and um, we went up through the northern Canada, through Montreal, up to Resolute Bay the northernmost uh, community in in Canada. And we were out there on the ice diving for a week. And the bleakness and just the landscape or ice scape was stunning. And I I knew then I was coming back um, that it was a captivating part of the world. It was just like an, it wasn't like another planet. Um, On that trip, and I recount this story in my first book, High Tide on Main Street, we had some Inuit, uh, the local guides, and we lost a snowmobile through the ice. Cool. And they wound up muttering a word, Ugianaktuk, which which when I got them to explain it, because they kept saying it, it was weather behaving strangely. And it should not, the ice should not have been that thin. Yeah. The, it was unusually warm, and there was some some unusual patterns happening. And these locals, you know, from generations there were surprised. And uh, in hindsight, we can say that that was around the time that global warming was having its early impact in the Arctic. Uh, Nobody could put that together back then. Um, Then in, you know, trips to Antarctica and to Greenland, which are the two big ice masses on land, and now are my attention because of that's what will determine sea level rise globally as they melt. Um, The, they're, uh, the vastness is vastness understates the the the, the scale mm-hmm. when you see Greenland, which is the same size roughly as Miami to Maine, and really? the east coast to the Mississippi. That's the size of Greenland, and it's covered by two miles of ice today, and it's melting quickly. And Antarctica is seven times bigger than that. the The scale is 
you know, hard to convey until you see it. Um, yeah. So uh, yes, <laughs> seeing those things in person changes your scale of reference. It's like the first time you've, if you've been out on a boat out of sight of land and you see the ocean all around you for as far as the eye can see, it just gives you a sense of, it changes your scale perspective. John, I, I want to keep tapping into your experience here because you've seen so much. You've tracked this topic over such a critical juncture and, and several decades of time. And you've talked to people about this issue all over the world. So I'm curious, have there been any talks that you've given that stand out to you, maybe because of the the people, the location, or the questions that were asked of you that you think our listeners might find interesting? Great question. I think it's pretty universal across all audiences. And I've talked to you know scientists and engineers and architects and military leaders and intelligence agencies and 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 so on. We tend to underestimate sea level rise, or we're almost in denial because mm -hmm. for a simple reason. We've never seen sea level be higher than it is. The last time sea level was higher was 122,000 years ago when it got 25 feet higher. We find that incomprehensible. And because we have trouble believing sea level could be much higher, even though it has been in the past and the physics are really simple, it's so disturbing and threatening to us that we do this cognitive dissonance. If something's terrible enough, you kind of find a way to change subject. And so what I find is that um, no matter how sophisticated the audience and how logical and educated, they've often not put, put the pieces together and seen this picture that it, it is gonna happen. It's unstoppable, we can slow it a bit and we should try, but we really need to begin adapting to sea level being higher as a permanent global you know, new, new shoreline for 140 nations that border the ocean. And um, I, I don't think I've ever encountered a group that, that wasn't stunned by that. And the fact, second, that it's unstoppable, that while we should work to be sustainable and reduce the carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas emissions, which there's you know little dispute about, that we've also got to accept that we're in a new world, a new era of climate, and that future sea level 20, 30, 40 years from now is going to be a further surprise. So uh, I don't think it matters what somebody's educational background is or even professional expertise. Rarely do people get to connect the dots and see the big picture on sea level. And, and so, John, I think that's actually super interesting. And I can relate to perhaps how your audiences might feel because, well, you know, I've always seen you know, Scott, you, you circulated yesterday even yeah. these renderings of what different cities would look like with different levels of sea level rise. And it's like, you know, holy cow, I, okay, I, I can see it rendered here. But at the same time, I've, I've never seen it in person. It's jarring. And, and so it's, it's very jarring. And so I think, John, this is a question we have for later in the conversation, but I think it, it's a good one to bring up now, which is in your book, which we'll, of course, talk about a little bit more deeply one of your points is that if we stopped pumping out greenhouse gas emissions today, we would still see significant warming due to the excess heat stored in the ocean. Kind of getting back to your point that, well, sea level rise is kind of inevitable. And it's something that I think when folks, myself included, think about, it's, it's tempting to just throw your hands up and say, well, kind of screw it. We're, we're effed regardless, yeah. right? So, so I'm, I'm just curious, John, I mean, how does that make you feel focusing in this area? And John, just so you know, we did an episode on eco-anxiety, and I encourage the listeners yeah. to check that out as well. Oh, great. I'll have to listen to that myself. Um, so, uh, Jay, th it's a great question, and certainly parts of this are uh, depressing or distressing or unfortunate, and yeah. we all can look at it that way. The good news with sea level rise, and I'm saying that in, in quotes, but the good news here is we have decades to adapt, but we have no time to waste. I'm curious, though, because a part of my brain is like, well, you know, we've already got the sunny day flooding in Florida. We've seen communities being relocated from lower lying areas farther inland. Is there a kicker moment that 
helps us turn the corner to get there? Or do you perhaps see it as more of a, a gradual or of a gradual call to action, perhaps over those several decades during which you're, you're saying we can address it? I think the increased awareness will be gradual, but uh, accelerating. I think events which are unpredictable, like Hurricane Sandy, uh, you know, a decade ago, flooding New York City, or the floods that happened a month ago from New York City, again, flooding the subways. And the weeks before that was in central Germany with with cities flooding that beyond all historical record. I think those events uh, make us sensitive to the rather unrelated phenomenon of sea level rise. I saw that during Hurricane Sandy, which happened to be the week my first book came out. And so I was very attuned to it that when people see extreme flooding, they start to pay more attention to sea level rise. But it's a different phenomenon, so we have to educate them. Because thinking of sea level rise as, as like a superstorm hurricane is, is frankly quite different. But in the human brain, we seem to contextualize things that way. So to answer your question, I think it's going to be the gradual drumbeat of strange weather from wildfires to droughts to, to deluge rains, right? All these strange weather extremes. And then the sunny day flooding events or king tides as they're sometimes called that are, you know, follow the 18 or 19 year moon cycle, lunar cycle of, of tides, but are getting higher and higher. And they're getting higher and higher because sea level's rising and sea level's the hidden thing. It's like the drip filling the bucket. You can't see the effect with any one drip, but the rate of the drip is accelerating, the drip being the ice melting on Greenland and Antarctica. And so I think it's all these things coming together that at some point our human brain, um, which they say is like the reptilian or limbic brain, you know, that really responds to shiny objects and to threats. Mm -hmm but otherwise <laughs> wants to continue lying in the sun on the riverbank as the rock <laughs> crocodile, um, that we don't want to be disturbed from the things we want to do. It takes a serious threat or a serious temptation. And I think that in the coming years and decades, that will happen. We just don't know the trigger events. Yeah. And John, you talk about the need to act, right? And you know, preparation for this interview and doing this episode, I've been trying to consume even more beyond your book. And one of the things that I listened to recently was a New York Times, The Daily Podcast, where they talked about two communities in North Carolina, one that had faced severe flooding, and it wasn't a very wealthy town, very small town, and people were moving away, so the tax base was shrinking. They weren't sure if the town would come back. You know, they had a plan, but not sure they would have the money. And then another town that was on the Outer Banks of North Carolina had some more money, and they actually voted recently to do beach nourishment as a way to blunt some of the effects of sea level rise. But they also know that this is going to cost millions of dollars, and it's only going to help us for five years. And then what do we do? And the main point at the end of the episode that they seemed to make was, we don't have a long-term fix to this. And I wonder if you would agree with that sort of take on point. I know in your book, you talked about mega dams and some of the other bold, intelligent adaptation that can be done. You know, would you agree that there isn't a long-term fix or there's just a lot of different things we can try? I mean, how would you frame it? Let's, let's think there's, there's several kinds of flooding and we have to start thinking about short-term flooding and long-term flooding. There's a town or part of Amsterdam where they've zoned it and they have these floating amphibious houses houses that are on ground, but when there's short-term flood events, the houses float quite safely hmm. and their utilities come in through an umbilical, some flexible hoses that go up and they can sustain floods until the water goes down and then they're back on ground. So that's an innovative kind of architecture and engineering. I can see many communities doing that to cope with short-term floods. Now, when sea level is 10 feet higher, let's say 100 years from now, it's easy to see that the places that are just bit by bit piling up sandbags or pumping sand right. to the beach will have changed. Now, the question is, when does it become obvious that they need to take a big step versus just building the seawall a little bit higher or bringing in a little more fill or raising their house two feet? 
And the truth is it depends upon the rate of sea level rise. And that's an unknown factor because the rate of sea level rise depends almost entirely on the rate of Greenland and Antarctic melting. The ice on land, as you talked about in your introduction, that melting icebergs have no effect on sea level because they're, melt, they're floating ice. But it's the ice on land, 98% of which, as you noted, is in two places, Greenland and Antarctica. But if all those places melted, both those places, sea level would be 200 feet higher. Now, that's not going to happen for centuries. The question is, what could happen in the next 50 to 100 years? And we could have 5 or 10 feet of sea level rise. Yeah. We don't know. So when, when do we see the self-interest to move to higher ground, as you say, or to build things on floats or for, you know, for temporary submergence or flooding? Um, this is a new adventure for us. The problem is we have an estimated 500 million people that potentially could be displaced over the next 100 years by rising waters. That's an incredible number, of course. And that number is not mine. It's from The Economist, uh, certainly a highly reputed magazine. Because um, we got to think about Bangladesh and Vietnam and, you know, coastal megacities like Shanghai and Jakarta. You know, not not just New Orleans and you know Annapolis and and San Francisco and places like that. It's a global phenomenon. The world does not want to move inland or to higher ground. They like where they're living now, but the coast is going to change. Right, and I'm glad you brought up the displacement of people that this is going to cause. Because one thing we also wanted to ask you was about the equity dimension here, and does it concern you that? Certain coastal areas might have more money to address. This is what the New York Times podcast was hitting on. Does it concern you that some people might have an easier place to go if they do want to retreat? You know, can you talk to us a bit about some of the equity dimensions here and sort of what how you think it should be done to ensure that we're trying to treat people as fairly as possible? You know, it, it's a huge concern. I mean, the people who who uh, you know have millions of dollars and can just buy a house inland or 200 feet above sea level, of course, they'll solve the problem for themselves. We do need to be concerned about the tens or 100 million people who are going to need some assistance. We need to find vehicles to to equalize things and get them out of harm's way. But um, we shouldn't kid ourselves that money alone, it's going to take attitude changes. And I also point out in my book, Moving to Higher Ground, that People in Bangladesh, I, I cited one example where because they're living at the water's edge and subsistence that and sea levels rise is already being a problem, that that they're they're already adapting, that they they're putting us their school is on a boat and they pick up the kids and teach them during the day, and the power comes from solar panels on the roof of the boat. Yeah. And they have floating farms in parts of, of Bangladesh where they're actually uh, using you know empty milk jugs to float these PVC pipes with nets and and growing their food you know at the water surface instead of on ground. So it it may be that people who are, are living more of a subsistence survival today are more inventive mm. and more adaptive, and without the you know the burden of of. Uh, you know, our sophisticated Western culture. So, so I think it's going to be a very um, eye-opening and uh, surprising journey of how do different cultures cope with this. But certainly the, the equity of not adding hundreds of millions of people as, as climate refugees due to our not planning for sea level rise is a big concern. We do need to think ahead on this and make people aware. And so, John, there's there's no, unfortunately, shortage of complications that sea level rise is going to cause. However, you also say that rising seas will be the largest economic driver this century. So can you tell us about businesses or governments that are building infrastructure, perhaps in more inland places that are anticipating more people moving in from the coasts, you know, how would you look at coastal property values and, and how those are going to be impacted by, by sea level rise? Like, like what, where does your mind go? 
Yeah, or the lakes. I think you mentioned yeah. uh, John in your book about the ones that have access to the ocean but aren't as susceptible to sea level rise might stand to gain that sort of thing. Yeah, sure. So um, the the lakes are a good example, and rivers. I mean, from the Mississippi River, once you get up past uh, past the tidal zone at the mouth of the Mississippi, but and up the rivers and up to Missouri, up to the Great Lakes. Uh, they're not directly affected by sea level rise, and and the fact that people need want to be on waterfront both for for pleasure, but uh, shipping and so on, that those places will be much more stable. Now they're still going to have flooding, like Chicago's got some problems because of the heavier rainfall that we're getting, mm-hmm. again part and parcel of climate change. But it's not sea level rise. The Great Lakes, most people don't realize, but they're anywhere from two hundred and fifty to six hundred feet above sea level, so they're they're isolated from sea level physically. I think lakefront properties will do better as a rule, but you have to be careful where there are some exceptions to that. But the simple answer is we are going to tend to move to higher ground. Now, the disruption, as we've been covering in this podcast, are going to be huge. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people relocating. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's already started, as I cite in the book, um, there are a couple of cases where literally people have re- read my my work or heard a lecture and sold their coastal property <laughs> and moved to the mountains. Um, that will continue. But to answer your question about investments, I think companies that that make pumps are going to do well for a while. Although you you can't infinitely pump this water as sea level rises, but there will be more need for pumps and construction firms that do coastal engineering and building seawalls would do well. Mm-hmm. But the real big plays will be beyond that. They're going to be developing mega cities that are on high ground, 200 feet above sea level, and where there's monorails taking freight to the coast, knowing that the ports are going to move or adapt as, uh, as as sea level rises. I mean, the global supply chain is going to be one of the big things. You know, you hear about China engineering their Belt and Road Initiative for a new global uh, uh, supply chain of, over land and sea. And even some of those cities are going to have to be rethought in a world of rising sea level. But uh, today we have a problem with the global supply chain just as a result of the pandemic. It was in the New York Times, I think, you know, the other day, an article talking about the, the, the huge backlog and freight backlog because people, more people are buying things online because they're not going outdoors. They're not going to stores as much. And the, the sea freight is piling up to the point of choking the ports right now. Well, if that's happening today, imagine what will happen as certain ports are submerged or at least threatened by flooding so much that people find alternate ports and alternate routes for the freight. Well, the people who can look at those opportunities and either short the risky places or invest up front, you know, in the in the places to make them part of the future supply chain will no doubt benefit. Yeah. And you talk about all the ramifications and the professions that are needed and it reminds me, I did an interview with the dean of my law school a week or two ago, and I brought up your book, John, and I said, because he was asking what should some law students pay attention to with climate change, I said sea level rise, because you think about, as you've pointed out, the trillions of dollars that are going to come off of balance sheets, and likely all the legal battles over contracts. Like, Talk about positioning yourself well as an attorney. I think if you can be that contract expert when it comes to sea level rise, I think would be quite a good position to be in. Um, But I want to go back to a point you made earlier about getting the reality to sink in. And one of the things I really appreciate about your book is you have a lot of easy to comprehend examples and metaphors. And one of the things we talked about in the introduction, right, was your ice cube example. eh, You have ice cubes in the glass with the soda and the ice cube melt. It's not like the actual amount of liquid that it went higher. So I wonder, though, are there other metaphors that could be in your book or ones you've come up with recently that you find particularly illuminating pe- to people that you want to make sure our listeners hear during the course of the episode? Yeah, sure. So, you know, one is where I talk about the, the lag times from higher heat to melting ice to raising water level. And I, I use the example of like if you if there was a, a, a lake or a pond and coming out of winter, 
there was still ice floating on the pond, but the flowers were blooming, you know, nearby and the air was getting warmer already. You can have ice in the water and um, yet the land is already warm to, you know, spring or summertime temperatures, depending upon the volume of the ice, because it takes a while to melt ice. And that we're still in that mode, but melting the ice has a lag time from when the actual heat is applied. I mean, if you took a big enough block of ice, it's not going to melt Im immediately. It, it takes a while. An example where you can almost do that experiment is you put a big pot of water on the stove and put a lot of ice in it, let the water cool down. Now turn up a burner, you know, turn the heat on, just what we're doing to the planet because of trapping more greenhouse gases. And when you inject that heat into the pot of water on the stove, the ice will start to melt quicker, of course. When you turn the heat on, if you turn the heat off again, the gas or electric, the ice is still going to melt because you've warmed the water. And that's what we've done to the oceans. We've warmed the oceans 1.1 degrees Celsius. That's 2.2 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. That extra heat in the ocean is not going anywhere soon. It's going to keep melting the ice no matter what we do with the greenhouse gases. I mean, we can slow it by about 30% if we work hard. Okay, John, let's actually move to our traditional last question here. So let's pretend that the three of us are hanging out in St. Mark's Square in Venice and lamenting the, the flooding and the questionable future of this beautiful city. And then we're seeing there's some people across the way that are interested in our conversation. and We want to engage them with some interesting party fact about sea level rise to bring them in. What would be that one party fact, that one stat that you would throw out at this conversation or a party generally to get people to just be like, whoa, about sea level rise? Well, this, the one that I tend to gravitate to is to say that sea level hasn't changed much in 6,000 years, all of human civilization. Mm -hmm. Before that, it was, it was 400 feet lower and 25 feet higher. Hmm. And that happened before man's impact. And so that should be our wake-up call. But the fact is now sea level's rising because the planet's warming because the ice is melting. And in fact, we should be going in the opposite direction according to the natural cycles. So the natural cycles should wake us up to realize that we were naive to think that sea level is permanent, but also we now have clear proof that the extra greenhouse gases trapping more heat are putting us in a warming phase with sea level rising when by nature we should be in the opposite phase. And that, um, Fa those facts from geologic history, which are easily verifiable and in, not in any dispute, gives us a reality that uh, most people find intriguing and provocative. Well, thanks, John, for helping us and our listeners better understand the reality around sea level rise. It's, it's coming whether we like it or not. We got to grapple with it. We got to adapt to it. And thanks for all that you do to help everybody with that. Well, thanks to both of you for you know spreading the word and enlarging the audience. Thanks, John. So Scott, we're, we're talking about sea level rise. We're mm -hmm. talking about perhaps rates of acceleration that are imperceptible often to the naked eye. Okay. De de definers know that I like to at least attempt to end these episodes with a joke. And I am crossing my fingers that the quality and, and funniness of my jokes is accelerating at a rate perhaps faster than sea level rise. Maybe the quality needs to double every episode. When we're still doing this this podcast in the year 2100, I think my jokes will be approximately 10 feet better than they oh, are geez. right now. All right, that, that was too much. <laughs> too soon. All right, so as we wrap up this episode, we do want to thank the folks that make it possible. Number one, a shout out to Amelia Kovach for putting together this set of intro notes, which is thorough, visual, and, and super impactful. She even Saturday morning is helping us check check facts right before recording. So Right, and, and after it. notably a fun night out. So, Amelia, <laughs> kudos <laughs> to you. We also want to thank Square Peg, Round Hole, and Potions for the music we use in this episode. And, of course, shout out to Keaton Butler for editing this episode into the beautiful piece of audio work that you hear now. Mm -hmm. Definers, our next episode coming up is our annual holiday hodgepodge. So get pumped for that. Email us at hosts at sustainabilitydefined.com or message us on social media with your favorite sustainable holiday gift ideas. 
as well as any feedback you have on the show. We'll do our best to incorporate those into the upcoming episode. And lastly, of course, do not forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the show to help us keep on growing. And Jay, speaking of feedback, I mean, certainly one way we get them is through these reviews. And we got a new one, Jay, that we're going to read. There we go. We got, we got one. That's we all we need. We it into existence. So if you're listening to this, you can be the next review we, we read. I mean, it's, <laughs> you just need to be that one. So Google Dan, <laughs> thank you, Google Dan, he posted on October 7th to our Apple podcast page with this review. It's called Strengthening My Resolve. He says, sustainability is such a broad topic these days. It feels like everyone just throws it out on their work as a tagline, and boom, you're all of a sudden saving the planet. But so much of that is messy and can actually lead to misinformation. Insert Jay and Scott. Their passion for bringing real, detailed, true efforts of ongoing sustainability is refreshing and empowering. Hearing the insight from guests who are currently advocating and developing sustainable practices and development is enlightening. As someone who has been on the fringe of this type of work, Jay Scott and their host of guests have further inspired me to go all in and go after my dream of building back safer, sustainable communities with long-term solutions for critical infrastructure across the country and hopefully the world. Thank you and keep going. Google Dan. Oh, man, oh. that's a wonderful review. Wow, that really you know gives me resolve to keep on going as well. So thank yeah, you, Google seriously. Dan. Appreciate it. And, and man, we are all behind Google Dan and, and achieving his goals because obviously yeah. we will all benefit from it. My goodness. Google Dan, you need to connect with us on LinkedIn and reach out to us so we can, you know, connect and, and help you on, on what is a collective journey here. So Right, right. With that, Jay, I think that about does it. You all stay sustainable out there. I'm Scott Breen. And I'm Jay Siegel. We will see you next time.